Today's show is brought to you by Pacer ETFs. Ben, remember back in the day when Amazon was fundamentally ludicrously expensive based on every traditional valuation metric? Yeah, that's why you shorted it. That's true, actually. That is true. Uh, what I, you know, what I did wrong, I wasn't looking at the free cash flow. It wasn't about the bottom line because they were deliberately plowing money back into the business. They were growing their free cash flow. So the Pacer Cash Cow series, which has grown to over $35 billion in AUM, uses free cash flow yield, which is basically, not basically, it's free cash divided by sales. So they use that screen to identify top growth companies. And if I did that, not only would I not have been short Amazon, I might have actually bought it. Two featured funds include Cow G, that is the Pacer US large cap cash cows growth leaders ETF, as well as CAF G. Oh, CAF G. I like that. Uh, get it? CAF for small cows? That's small caps. That's CAF G. To learn more, visit paceretfs.com. Welcome to Animal Spirits with Michael and Ben. Ben, do you know where I'm going to be in three weeks? Spring break. Woohoo! Spring break. I, right? I still don't understand the staggered spring break around the country. I think the schools must get together and put their heads together so you don't have everyone traveling at the same time. It's a yeah, good thing. That makes sense. Wait, so what are you doing in LA game besides the, the event? What, what what amusement parks are you going to? Well, before we get to the amusement parks, Tuesday, April 30th, Josh and I are doing a live uh, live episode of The Compound and Friends. We've got two very exciting guests. One of the guests we speak about on this podcast quite frequently. So any listeners of this podcast will recognize that guest. Uh, that's Tuesday night, April 30th, link in bio, tickets in the uh, show notes, et cetera, et cetera. Um, all right, what am I doing in Los Angeles? Taking the boys to Disneyland. I haven't been there in, I went there in camp way, way, way back. Uh, uh, how, I don't, I'm curious how much of a discount in Disneyland trades to Disney World. Because I've never been to Disneyland. I've only been to Disney World. I'm curious, is it 75% of Disney World? In terms of the ticket prices? No, not the prices, just the the overall experience. Well, is it, you know. It's a much more manageable, uh, much more manageable park. It's like a bite-sized Disney World, you know? That's good. You've you know, like the fun before. size Twix? Yeah. That's what it is. My kids like those. And then we're going to Universal, which I am incredibly excited about. Uh, not just for myself, but also Better roller coasters. No, I'm just, well, the movies, uh, there's a Nintendo land or Nintendo, something or the other. Can't wait. My son just got into Mario Kart on his iPad. Yeah. And, same. Uh, great. Hooked. Great game. Oh, so speaking of vacations, people, people, people gave us a gentle ribbing last week. Just, you know, it seems like you guys take a lot of vacations. Yeah. And Vacation, uh, vacation, it's a it's a bull market of vacations for sure. It it is we talked about the travel boom, but here's my thinking on this though, that um I part of it is that I think where we are at our stage in life, especially you've heard this stat. I can't verify it, but I, I it seems directionally right that you spend 90% of your face to face time with your children before age 18. And I think it's like 75% before age 12. And I always tell this to my wife, and she's like, stop, don't I don't want to hear it. Um but that time is fleeting, right? I always say there's like a, there's a countdown on this, right? When your children are young, you spend more time with them. And so for me, prioritize what priority wise, spending on vacations and experiences is a huge part of what I prioritize as spending. Same. Uh, I am. I, I wonder if these are peak spending years for me. I feel like maybe I'm a bit early for that, but I have no problem spending money on things like this. These are this is what life's all about today, actually. In terms of time being fleeting, my mother would have turned 70 today. Uh, she died when she was 56. And that had a, I mean, obviously a massive impact on me for many different reasons. But one of the biggest impacts on my life was tomorrow is not promised. You have no idea how long you're gonna right. be on this planet for. So I am these are the, these are like these are probably the best years of our life right now. And the other thing is we don't really have hobbies outside of like reading and writing and finance and our jobs. I play and, in the men's league. And our well, you do play in the men's league. Look at that. <laughs> and our families are like, I know people who spend an obscene amount of money every year to join a golf club. Like there's, I know people who've joined golf clubs in the area here and they, they go to the club and they have the pool and they have the restaurant and stuff. And the, the access fee is insane. I have friends who go hunting. And so you have people who have all these other hobbies. You and I, we don't have hobbies. Like 
my family is one of my hobbies. And so that's why traveling is a big part of it. So anyway, I just wanted to say that like we prioritize that that area of spending. And also, I think we could we could pivot into a travel podcast at some point because we get reviews about resorts and pictures from people's travels in our inbox all the time. I I, I kind of like I really like those emails from people that send us the pictures from their trips and give us good resort reviews. Anyway. Um yeah, I think it's it's like important to prioritize your spending. That's that's my point here. Amen. Right, sp- speaking of, you have a white men can't jump T-shirt on, which I think is apt. You sent me a couple weeks ago. Uh, it looked like a little local newspaper, and it was a story. And you said, "Look at the picture." And it was a picture of you on the basketball court with like thirty other middle-aged guys, and like a pic, like a, it was like a team photo. And it said, "It's like." Oh wait, but did you see the zoomed-in photo of me? Yeah, you were in there. No, no, Why, no. What? I had my own photo. I didn't sh- sh- show that to you. Yeah, I th- yeah, you did. Yeah, okay. so it was on there, right? For some so reason, it was all these it different like I'm in that picture. Oh, oh, middle-aged men playing, league, and it was something that. Tell me the story here. What do you mean? There's no story. Why, why did they do a story on a middle-aged men's league? Oh yeah, that's. I mean, it was it was for the local paper. Obviously, it wasn't like okay. a, it wasn't in the New York Post. I'm not quite sure why. I think somebody Slow somebody news tipped day. off somebody tipped off the local media. I don't know who. Okay, that you just this is a men's league that's been going on for a while or something. It's I still can't By the way, speaking of what they can jump, I did. I haven't played in a while, and I I jumped last night to touch a backboard. I'm not quite sure why I did that, but as soon as I jumped, I was like, Ugh! "So you asked me where I'm sitting today? My my back sore." <laughs> you you did pull something because usually you're standing. Okay, <laughs> that makes sense. Uh, okay, last week we talked about how enjoy this bull market while it lasts because like it's not always going to be this good. Lisa Abramowitz tweeted: "The S and P 500 hasn't had a two percent down day since February 21st, 2023." This is a 12th longest streak since 1928, according to City Group. That's mm. pretty good. Not bad. Uh, Bespoke had a chart that shows the current versus average total returns going back to 1928. So it shows the 1, 2, 5, 10, and 20-year annual returns. And obviously, the one-year return is off the chart. It's like a 30% gain. But it, five years is close to 15% annualized versus the historical 10% or whatever. 10-year, too, is almost 13% versus 10 or 11% annualized. 20% is actually a little lower. But anyway, the point is, this is the good stuff here. This it's not always going to be like this. This is the good stuff. Okay. Uh, so I had our new chart wizard, Matt, pull up a chart. I said, you know what? The more I think about it, the more the COVID c- crash. Which I, I want to trademark that one. I want to put a TM after that. COVID crash. It's got to be called something. That, that well, You can't trademark that. That's not, that's not a Ben Carlson thing. I'm sorry. You can't own that. Why? No one, I've, heard, a, I've heard anyone say that. The uh, COVID what crash. Are you, what are you, uh, Dr. Evil? <laughs> I created the question mark. What, what did Josh say he created a couple weeks the ago? Josh said he literally invented Blue Striver. One of the oh, Blue most Stra- obscene okay. lines in podcast history. Okay. My, my older brother claims he created the, the drinking game Passback. Never heard of it. Well, if, if you have like three beers to finish and you're leaving to go to a bar or a party and you have to finish the beers, you can't leave them there. You can't leave a, a man behind. You take a drink and you pass to someone else mm, until it's yeah. gone. Anyway, so the COVID crash lines up with the Black Friday pretty good. They're both fell 30 plus percent in a very short period of time. And I wanted to say, okay, what happens? It's been four plus years since this happened. So what happened since? And because there was a pretty big rally off of the 1987 uh, crash, we've actually rallied harder. So we're close to 150% from the bottom, whereas the Four years after the 1987 crash, it was up 100%. Hmm. Now, obviously, that bull market kept going. There was a 1990 correction, but it kept going for, you know, whatever, 13 more years. If we if we um, match that 1980s to 1990s bull market, we're talking, what, six or seven more years? of the, Can you imagine no. a bull market lasting that long? Yes, so I if, know. I mean— the knee-jerk reaction is no, just given how great the market has been. It's hard for me to picture. It would just be so out of whack with really anything that we've seen in history. Well, maybe that's not true. Well, the, no, the 80, that's what I'm saying. If, if a, it was the 80s right, and 90s analog. Right, right. So if we had our AI bubble, that's the crazy thing. Like There was a, in a, a great period of time from 1980 or whatever to 1994. It was pretty good returns. And but, but, then you juiced from 95 to 99. Yeah, I know. But the the there's many differences. One of the main ones was that what kicked off that when, when that bull market kicked off, the ten year was at fifteen percent or wherever it was at, True. and the PE was at nine. Yes, that's <laughs> right? fair. So, 
Uh, can can we ride the AI wave if AI is going to add one and a half percentage points to GDP, which is what some people are, are predicting? Who knows That's what, what I'm it's saying though? Do. If you wanted that analog, you would say, okay, AI ramps up now, and this is the dot com part of that that phase. Yeah, I mean, earnings are going to have to power. If, if that were the case, I, I don't see like multiple expansion carrying the torch. It would have to be earnings. Uh, I'm not I'm not predicting that obviously, but okay, I'm just saying listen, like every time we we talk about what could happen, I always think like oil went negative. Like why take anything off the table? True. That's fair. All right. Uh, I saw this chart flying around from Goldman. The U.S. equity market is near the most concentrated in a century, and this shows the market cap of the largest stock relative to the 75th percentile stock. And it shows all these times in history. It's funny because the, the highest it was ever is 1932, which is the bottom of the Great Depression. And so some of these are like bottoms. Some of them are tops. What this chart shows to me, it's not, I mean, obviously concentration is a big component of this, but it's also large relative to mid and small. Right. My my whole thinking here, though, is so what? At this point, like the mar- the concentration stuff, I'm to the point where it's like, it doesn't worry me at all. Like, I don't, I don't worry about it. It doesn't keep me up at night. Some people think like it's such a huge problem. Unless the government is going to go break up the big tech companies. I mean, if you're betting on mean reversion, that's one thing. But why, why worry about something like this? The biggest, best companies are the, are the biggest stocks. Well, hold on. Let's just define this. There's like degrees of worry, right? So would I prefer the market to be less concentrated, all else equal, just in terms of like diversification benefits? Probably. Um, am I worried in the extent that I don't think you should own the S&P 500 and that if NVIDIA falls, that it's going to take the entire market down with it? Uh, could happen. But it's not necessarily something that keeps me up at night. That's what I'm saying. And I get it. People in finance are, are worriers. That's just part of the yeah. ball. Like the, yeah. you know, the, we talk about the bad stuff hurts more than the good stuff feels good. But it, it, in for my, my, yeah, my hierarchy of worries, things like index funds and market concentration are very low. Yeah. Well, I would say hey, I'm worried about everything when it comes to the market. Like everything worries me. Uh, so in terms of like my priority of worries, this is. Uh, and as, as we've talked about. The stuff that's going to get you, though, is going to be the stuff you're not even thinking about or worrying about right now. Yeah. It's going to be something else, probably. This is an interesting one from Bespoke, too. The median S&P energy stock has a larger market cap than the median S&P 500 technology sector stock. Yet tech has a weighting of 30% and energy is at 4%. This is kind of why the concentration thing to me, I, I don't know. I just don't know if it matters. Right? Like, yeah, energy is more diversified than tech by median market cap. But so what? That's my point. What's your point? That it just, it's not a big, it's not a big deal. It's not. Right. Well, right now it's not, certainly. I don't. <laughs> yeah. I and mean, again, it, it, the, the meter version thing will happen eventually where small caps and mid caps will outperform. And, but I don't think that's a, I don't think you, you worry that markets are cyclical. That's just a, the way markets are. I'm not, I think what, what warriors would say is look what happened in 2000 when tech, sco- tech stocks came crashing down. They took the rest of the market with it. Now, if you can't see the differences between between today and back then, uh, I can't do anything for you. But it's not inconceivable that a similar outcome might unfold. True. And it's also not inconceivable that the tech sector could underperform and other sectors will move up and, and do better. Energy, remember, energy was just terrible for like 2014 to 2020, whatever. Just did well, Ben, that would, that would truly be the coup de grace. If tech stocks either go sideways or fall or underperform, you know, in some sort of direction and the rest of the market leads the charge financials, consumer yes. discretionary stocks like that would, that would really ram it down the bear's throat. That'd be fun. Speaking of coup de gras, Mike Francesa said it in the video and, and credit to you for giving a smirk at the camera after he said it. <laughs> I like that. That was a record scratch freeze frame moment. That was yeah, that was uh that was exciting. Well played. Yeah, this has been the the 2024 is the year of Michael Batnick recording with his heroes. Well, listen. E- Eli and Mike Francesa, who else is there? Denis? Listen, 2010 was Can you get can we get Denis to talk with you in LA and then we can just be check too much. all the boxes? 2010. Yeah, 24, 2024 is a good year for 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 Michael. 2010 I made $416. So, but let me ask you this. As people transition 
and not just specifically to me, but I'm, it is something I've been thinking about. As people transition from, I'm, I'm looking for a better word other than rags to riches because I would not accurately describe. I, I neither had rags nor riches, but like think about a. This is a ludicrous example, but like LD, for example, there was a an Instagram video of the the last scene in the shoot in in the in the the last scene of the last episode, the series finale, which it is, where um, Richard Lewis was so grateful to Larry, thanking him for treating him like a god. Where Cheryl was crying, she said, "The the minute I met you, my entire life changed." And it was very touching. And I was watching him, and I, I shed a little bit of a tear. Robin goes, You're, why are you crying? I'm a sensitive guy. <laughs> but anyway, my point is, so so after that, in classic LD Your fashion- Your wife does have to deal with, deal with you crying a lot, doesn't she? I do cry a lot. In classic LD fashion, he got very uncomfortable with the praise, and he sort of just turned and walked off the set. Did you see this clip? <laughs> no, I didn't. Okay. Um, so so I watched the finale last night, which I want to talk about later. Uh, so bringing this back to where I'm going, like Larry David is still Larry David. Obviously, he has a billion dollars, and his life is a lot different today than it was 40 years ago when he was driving a cab. But he's still the same person. So I do, I've do. i been thinking about the transition between like regular people and financially successful people. You know, because like I'm sure Bill Simmons has an example. Again, I'm using like, you know, the, the some of the wealthiest people in the world. But he probably still thinks himself as a kid from Boston, even though he's clearly a rich guy. You know what I mean? I think that's the that's also one of the weirdest parts about aging and entering middle age is in a lot of ways you still feel like the very same person. Yeah. No one ever told me that would right. happen when you get older. You, so as you think people when you're, when transition you're young, you, th- you think you get that more, you're you get more success and more this and more that. Like, I think some people ha- some people handle the transition better than others. True. All right. Speaking of transitions, where are we going? Uh. Sorry for derailing that. Um, okay. Uh, you know, Ben, we've been recording for almost 20 minutes now, and we've barely made a dent in the stock. Sorry for all the tangents. Speaking of, actually speaking of, and look, I'm about to derail the, the podcast again and prove this person's point. Ben, did you see this review that I shared with us? So once a week, I get like an email from Chartable, which I guess is like a podcast tracking chart. And it will share like a review or two. And this week's was was really chef's kiss. It was one star. Did you see this, Ben? Mm-mm. Okay. Here's the review. Sort of entertaining, not good. <laughs> uh, this can be entertaining, but lately I just skip it. I can only handle a few minutes of it at a time now. The hosts tend to go on tangents, so the flow isn't great. They also <laughs> give uninformed opinions too often. <sighs> eh, happens. Uninformed. Get okay. Um, the FT, <clears throat> the FT had a post about the S and P 500 hoovering up all the assets. So Ben, this would be the, so what of concentration, right? Is that there's the S and P 500 specifically mega cap tech, and there's everything else. And if these flows, if the sentiment, if the enthusiasm were to stall or God forbid reverse, Buckle up, buttercup. Uh, so ETFs tracking the S&P 500 vacuumed up a record $137 billion in net terms last year, uh, surpassing the previous peak of $119 billion in 2021. This accounted for a record 27% of all global equity ETF flows compared with just 9% in 2022, 13% in 2021, and 1% in 2020. That's pretty wild. Wow. That is, that's a good. So good, the, sentiment check, heat check, where are people in terms of their feelings towards the S&P versus the world? This is, but the whole, the whole way to hedge that risk is you be diversified. That's, that's why I'm not, that's why I'm not worried that if the S&P underperforms, diversification is the answer. Check out this chart. This is from Dimson, Marsh, and Staunton. U.S. equities approach mid 20th century dominance. So we're looking at the global stock market capitalization, capitalization by country. We're looking at the U.S., the U.K., Japan, Germany, China, and the rest of the world. And yeah, the U.S. is dominating. I mean, look at how bad the U.K. choked, though. They had a huge lead in 1900. What happened? British people, what did you do? (laughs) 
All right, uh, Eric Belchunas, this is interesting. Index funds make up 46% of Fidelity's assets, but only 6% of its revenue, which was $28 billion last year, about double the entire ETF industry. That gap may be one of the reasons they're looking to add a surcharge on ETF platforms, the optics of which may not be worth the money. So the thinking is, as more money flows into these index funds, these fund providers are going to have to think of a way to increase the revenue. Because obviously, the, the actively managed funds, even though there's outflows there, the gains in the market have more than helped there. Right? So they're still making money on those active funds, but the money is going to keep coming and keep, or keep leaving, keep leaving, keep leaving. So more of the money for f the fund industry is going to be in passive, which is way, way lower cost. So how do they recoup that, those fees? I, mean, I, don't, I don't know what the answer is. But they don't. You don't think they're going to figure out ways to recoup the fees somehow? No. Trading fees are gone. Index funds are paid nothing. No. They're going to have to make fees up somewhere else. Well, that's true. Are they going to replace entirely the fees that they're losing? I don't I don't see how they do that. I don't see how the math makes it work. Balchunas has written about this a lot, that even though there's been outflows of active mutual funds forever, the revenue, I think, is it? Oh, no. Yeah. Yeah, yeah. The assets are still at an all-time high just because of the tailwind from the market. Right. Market's going up. Doesn't mean that their bottom line is at an all-time high, right? Because the revenue might be, but profitability is obviously probably being crimped. So yeah, I, I, uh, this is a this is a big industry issue for sure. Um, inflows into investment-grade bonds on pace for record year, and it's not even close. This is this is cumulative, so it accounts for people are buying the dip in bonds. This, this usually it's you run to the exits when there's a fire. Everyone has been throwing money at bonds for the past year and a half. Yeah, and I think yields. the clear difference between this and stocks is that people are excited to lock in these yields for a longer period of time. But aren't we going to see flow inflows into bonds for the next 10, 15 years from baby boomers retiring? Or is that not a big enough chunk of assets to to move some? I because can't you see people retiring and getting more conservative that they're going to have to put more money into bonds? In so, the what do you think years? the buying pressure is going to bring yields down? I don't think so. I'm not necessarily, I'm, I'm just saying the flows, if we're looking at fund flows just for funds, ETFs and mutual funds, it's going to be more to bonds in the coming years than it is to stocks. I don't know about that. Maybe. But my, my point is this year is so far greater than any other year that we've seen. And it's because people are locking longer term rates. Not, there's not a counterpoint. It's a, and also, the inflows to money market funds are also on fire, just behind 2023. So, people are really excited about the idea that for the first time in recent memory, you can actually earn a return in your cash. And don't give me this well net of inflation because I'm sorry, investors do not think in real terms. They just don't. We're nominal beings. Yeah, but so this chart shows that three and a half months into the year, we've already almost surpassed the money no. market flows from last year. No, that's so not this what it shows. Cumulative annual flows. So if this trend were to continue for the rest of the year. Oh, okay. Gotcha. Okay, so it's annualized. Still a lot of, I, I'm just saying, mark it down. Talk to me in 10 years. There's going to be more money go, that have gone into bonds than, than gone into stocks in the next 10 years. Perhaps. Just demographically speaking, that it has to be. Well... But counterpoint, like the people that you're discussing, the baby boomers, they're not, there's no net new flows for those people. If you're 70 years old, your allocation is your allocation. So perhaps you glide path down over time. That's what I'm saying. It's the glide path. Uh, Greg Gipp in the Wall Street Journal. What's wrong with the economy? It's you, not the data. I'm sure this made a lot of people thrilled. <laughs> hey, he's not wrong. Well, for the overall economy, he's not wrong. <laughs> I know I have to caveat it every time saying not everyone in is included in the average, but well, for no, the overall no, no. economy, he's right. The, the th okay. So in the Wall Street Journal's latest poll swing states, 74% of respondents said inflation has moved in the wrong direction in the past year. This assessment, which holds across all seven states, is startling, sober, and simply not true. I'm not stating an opinion. This isn't something on which reasonable people can disagree. Facts, but these respondents are not dumb people. People without an economics degree, normal people, which influence the some narrative. of them are dumb people. Come on, What's some that? people just really don't. Some people really don't understand the economy. That's that's a fact. Everyone, how dude? How would you? If you're a normal person, how would you understand the economy? Why, if you do not think about this stuff every day, and somebody asks you, 
about uh, inflation, you're going to say prices. People are talk when people are asked about inflation, they're talking about prices, not the rate of change. Right. Yes, that's true. And so this this shapes everything. So while the facts are what they are, this is a case of feelings over facts. So Derek Thompson. Wait, this is another reason why all the information in the world that we have on a computer and an iPad and a, and a smartphone in our pocket almost means nothing without context or, or filtering understanding. You can have, because people have access to that information if they want it, but they, they don't access it for whatever reason or they can't or they can't find it or they don't care to. That's, well, the, that's all, why information is, that's why I like the AI thing with information is not going to change as much as people think in terms of how people feel and think and react. It's going to probably make things worse. Let's say that an economist or, or, or Greg Ip or whoever was asking a regular person, uh, what do you think about price change, uh, the inflation? Is it, is it up or down from where it was last year? And they say up. And this person says, no, actually, inflation was 6% a year ago. It's 3.5% today. The regular person would say, well, who f***ing, why? How is that relevant? Why, why are you asking me about that statistic? All I care about is prices are a lot higher than they were a year ago. Don't ask me about the rate of change. That's nonsense. I know, but my point is, look back through history. How often have we ever had deflation and prices go down? It never happens, basically. It's a non sequitur. No, it's not. Because yeah, it is. How, prices, what does that are always, prices are literally always going higher. I know they've been going higher more in recent years than we've had. That's like, it's a shock to the system. That's why people have been so concerned about it because we we haven't had this high in 40 years. But it, like, we're going to have inflation for the rest of your life. There's going to be like minor, minor bouts of deflation in a financial crisis. Other than that, prices will continue to rise as long as economic growth goes higher. That's the thing that people don't realize. Wages go higher, economic growth goes higher, prices go higher. That's the relationship. Derek Thompson says, where I've landed, grocery inflation sucks. Yep. Interest rates are high. Yep. Telling people the economy is better than your experience of it is a waste of time. Double yup. Um, unemployment is low. Real wages are growing. And the national economy really is better than people think. Yeah, I would agree with all that. Fair. We're, um, okay. we're, at a, we're, at a, we're at a stalemate. Who, you and I? No, everyone. Oh. With the economy and everyone's opinion. So like, Heather this, Long, this is why we almost, we almost we, honestly, I think people need a recession just to be like, I told you I was right. And then they can move on, right? We can get a recession, get it out of our system. And people can finally go, I told you the economy was bad. And now the economy agrees with me. That's what people need. Um, last week, we got really good job numbers. Heather Long tweeted, good news. There was a big jump in the labor force in March. That means more people are looking for work again. This is a great sign of confidence in the economy. Labor for, okay, um, whatever. And the replies on Twitter were almost uniformly negative. Like, yeah, but, and a lot of political shit and- As usual. As usual. So I, I have this thing, I'll go down to the labor market section here. We're skipping around the dock a little bit. Uh, I want to, I want to like, I went through and found some charts and data that kind of goes, like shows how strong the labor market really is. So Ben Castleman puts monthly job growth in 2021. Look at how steady this is in the like 250 to 300,000 range for well over a year now. And it's only increased later, lately. And a lot of people say, well, it's part-time workers, but look at this part-time workers as a share of total employment is higher than it was pre-pandemic, basically right on average since 2000. So it's not like you can say, well, it's all, all part-time workers. Uh, a lot of people say, well, labor force participation ratio is falling. And it's true if you look at the whole thing. Jed Kolko tweeted this though, and he you said- You don't see a lot of Jeds anymore. That's true. Yeah, add, add that name to the list. Uh, labor force participation rate he's showing is only down for people 65 and older, but actually like even 60 to 64 is up, 55 to 59. Hmm. So all these other ages are up, but it's the fact that people retired early. And that's why the labor force is, is lower for the older people and, and overall, because there's so many people retiring. And the immigrants thing, it is true. So Pew did this research saying uh, they show like going forward without future immigrants, working age population in the U.S. would decrease by 2035. So it's showing that it would, it would fall by like 18 million. But with immigrants, is going to continue to rise. And so it's saying the largest, but it's also saying the largest group joining the nation's working age population in that time will be 60 million people who were born in the country to U.S.-born parents and turned 25 between 2015 and 2035. 
but they will be outnumbered by U.S. born adults with U.S. born parents who turn 65 or die, meaning the people who are older are going to be retiring faster than new people are entering the labor force, right? So this is just, and every developed country is, is dealing with this. So the point is, we're going to need immigrants if we want to have growth. Let me ask you this, and maybe this is a bit of a third rail. So perhaps I shouldn't go there, but I'm going to go there. If Trump wins the White House and he inherits this economy as things currently exist, he will be social truthing. This, he's not on Twitter. He will be talking to the nation every day about record high in your 401k, record stock prices, a booming economy. He will be banging that drum every day. How quickly would national polls respond to that messaging? Well, we know this is politically based. So Republicans would immediately say the economy is better and Democrats would immediately say the economy is worse. Even if it's the exact same economy. Unfortunate state of affairs. True. Okay, Bloomberg, here's, here's something else. We're on a, a tangent of ben, stuff Ben is not worried about today, okay? Bloomberg has this headline, a million simulations, one verdict ahead for the U.S. economy, debt danger ahead. Bloomberg, economists, Bloomberg Economics ran a, mil, a million forecast simulations on U.S. debt outlook. 88% of them show borrowing on an unsustainable path. Now, I, I really wish they would have gone to 100% like they did with the recession call, just to stay in line with, with that call. But they, so, I, I feel like, they said in 88% of the simulations, the results show debt to GDP ratio on an unsustainable path defined as an increase over the next decade. Uh, Wait, you're, you're end, not worried about this at all? Just listen. Okay. In the end, it may take a crisis, perhaps a disorderly route in treasury markets triggered by a sovereign U.S. credit rating downgrade or a panic over the delete, depletion of Medicare or Social Security trust funds to force action. That's playing with fire. Here's my thinking here. This, this is something people have, we talked about, have always worried about, but what is the alternative to the treasury market for people? So if you're looking for a high quality bond, that's the thing people don't realize is that the U.S. debt is an asset to someone else. Retirees, pension plans, insurance companies, are they all of a sudden going to say, eh, you know what? We don't need treasuries anymore. Let's go buy emerging market debt or corporate <laughs> debt or something. Is that well, really going to happen? It, when you put it that way. So here's, here's Colin Roche's take. I often say the U.S. government isn't in financial trouble, and some accuse me of being a government agent, but my optimism about U.S. government debt extends from my optimism about corporate America and the fact that U.S. firms are hugely innovative, income-generating entities that give the U.S.D. credibility. Here's the thing we have going for us. If people are worried about this, and, and again, I'm not saying debt going higher isn't a problem if it's, if it's crowding out other forms of spending for the government, right, because interest expense is so high. Sure, that's a problem. But I think there are ways to fix it if our politicians ever decided to do so. My whole point is we can literally print our own currency, right? That's, that's number one. Number two, you don't think that if there really was some sort of treasury strike that the treasury and the Fed wouldn't figure out a way around it? Japan had their debt to GDP go to 300% or something. And they, they didn't have a, a, a crazy 10% spike in interest rates or whatever. My whole point is that, yes, we have some stuff to figure out politically, and the, and the politicians will probably wait until they're forced to do something. But this is the kind of thing that has solutions when you can print your own currency. That's my point, that the, the whole crisis situation of this is there's going to be this day of reckoning. I just don't see it. Yeah, that's what would a day I'm of reckoning look like? That, that's what I, people, they're, they're saying it's the treasury market blow up somehow. I'm less worried about a treasury market blow up, but, well, gold seems to be worried about, about this. Is well, that, but every time something, every time an asset goes up, people say, well, they're, it's worried about debt. Because remember when rates were rising in October? Well, people but, said, hold on. why gold are is, rates well, rising? Why do, you, well, do, you, do you think gold is going vert vertical for no reason? The, pr the Fed was printing money all throughout the 2010s. Why didn't gold go up then? I don't think it's a I feel like this issue. is a narrative a violation. People are just giving that narrative to gold because it's going up. This No, this is not a money printing issue. This is a interest rate debt unsustainable issue. I think this is correlation causation. I think people are just giving that narrative because gold is rising. You really think so? If, if that's the, the case, why didn't gold go up 50% in 2020 then? Because we printed all that money back then. I, but you keep saying the same thing, and I keep saying, I keep saying it's not a money printing issue. 
No, no, I'm saying we, the government spent trillions of dollars in 2020. Why didn't gold go up 50% that the, the, year? That was a one-time, that was a one-time or three-time thing. But that was a, that, that was a government, that, that got well, us into this issue. I don't issue. think you could hand wave away everything. I'm not saying that this is the end of the world, but- That's, a, that's the only point. I'm not worried about it as much as other people. I'm, I'm saying there are legitimate areas to worry that, again, it could crowd out other forms of spending. Well, how but, about this? I think, no offense, I think the market's smarter than you. And you, you might think that gold is moving up because it's just going up. I think, I think, and I could be wrong, that one of the fundamental drivers of this gold move is that people are worried about the debt. Now, they might, it might turn out to be worried for so no reason. The, so, that means, so if the Fed lowers interest rates, then gold should, should fall yeah. in, that scenario, in that scenario. In that scenario. Might not happen. I just think it's easy to, remember when rates were screaming higher to 5%, everyone said, well, the reason rates are going higher is because government debt is out of control. And then rates fell again. And guess what? It was just positioning. Here, here's where I people think, are just here, positioning for gold right now. Yeah. Here's where I do agree with you. The things that people obsessively worry about tend to be a gigantic distraction in the long run. That's my point. That's like, all I'm trying to get at. Most of these giant worries do not come to fruition. I agree. I completely were on the same page there. All right. Here's something that maybe we can worry about. This is interesting. Email from a listener. I know you guys love bearish charts. Wink emoji. Where is this? I don't this? use those very well. This is on, under layoffs. We haven't had anything there for a while. But curious what you guys think about this. You and Michael always have good, rational, optimist, big picture, grand scheme of things. Here's some data from this listener. California unemployment rate today, 5.3%. August 2022, the trough was 3.8%. Pre-COVID, 4.3%. This is what the email says. I was actually kind of shocked. I guess on the one hand, not good. On the other hand, the rest of the country must be doing great. And so I looked into this, and California does have the highest rate of unemployment in the whole country at 5.3%. Isn't it the tech layoffs, or is it not? Yeah. That, so I looked into this, and the AP had a story on it, and it's basically the, the tech layoff. But, uh, I mean, again, California is, what, the, what did we say, the sixth biggest economy in the world or something ridiculous like that? Uh that's a pretty substantial increase in unemployment there. Yeah. I, I, yeah, you're right. That is that. But if you look at, you know, so if you just Google like unemployment rate by state, uh, most of the other, most of the, that's the whole thing. He said, this must be great for the rest of the country. The lowest one is, you know, the two lowest ones are North and South Dakota, like two, 2%. But well, that's because 74 people live there. They're all employed. Well, in the energy, but the only ones that are over 5% are Washington, D.C., Nevada, and California. Hmm. And, you know, 80% of the countries are below 4% still. So California actually is the outlier. So we talk about this being like a tech recession. It really kind of has been. Ben, are you, um, you, you, did you literally not go outside yesterday to look at the, to look at the eclipse? Did you refuse to even tilt your chin higher? I, I, I looked up at it a couple times. With glasses Listen, on? I, I didn't have glasses. They're all sold out everywhere. The, Wait, you had, did I, you have regular sunglasses on? Yeah, I just I just glanced at it really quick and... Thoughts? I, <laughs> I mean, it is... Have you ever read any of the Bill Bryson books about the, like, the universe? Whatever his universe... It, he gives, like, these whole calculations for the... How everything lines up in the universe. And it, it almost doesn't seem real. But the, the fact that this stuff can happen is amazing. Um, I, I may have poo-pooed the eclipse a little bit yesterday on Slack. And all I didn't say it's overrated. I just said it's a little overvalued. In that I feel like <laughs> oh, wow. we- Wow. <laughs> I feel like we, I just, listen, there's, this is the problem with the internet because you have to either love every, love something or hate things. There's degrees of liking and hating. And I think the eclipse is cool, but I feel like every, every, Every office or every family or every friend group has that one person who went way overboard on the eclipse and was totally into everything about it. Totally. And I was I was further down on that those degrees of like, wow, yeah, this is pretty cool. Listen, own it. You poo pooed the eclipse. Own it. I feel like we just had one like three years ago, but it wasn't wasn't full. Yeah. I'm I'm just saying it 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 wasn't like top of the top of mind for me. Yeah, but, fair uh, enough. It was it was it was. It's, it's pretty cool. All right, a bunch of, we talked about Florida last week. A bunch of people sent us this NBC news story. They came for Florida sun and sand. They got soaring costs in a culture war. 
And tell me your thoughts about this first, and I'm going to give you mine because I, I feel like the the headline of this story in this in the the individual stories in it don't match the overall numbers. But and right. I feel like this is a good microcosm of the economy, right? Yeah. Now. Let me let me let's read the intro just to set this set the stage. One of the first signs Barb Carter's move to Florida wasn't the postcard life she envisioned was the armadillo infestation in her home that cost caused nine thousand dollars in damages. An ar- yeah, an armadillo infestation that would uh. That would send me running as well. We I saw an armadillo at some Florida. I think went to the zoo in Naples, and they're, cute. they're pretty cute. They're pretty cute. Yeah, they're cute, but not not in the home. My kids would love an armadillo in the station. <laughs> then came a hurricane, ever present feuding over politics and an inability to find a doctor to remove a tumor from her liver. After a year in the Sunshine State, Carter packed her car with whatever belongings she could fit and headed back to her home state of Kansas, selling her Florida home at a forty thousand dollars loss and leaving behind the children and grandchildren. She moved closer. She moved to be closer to. So many quote. So many people ask, "Why would you move back to Kansas?" And I tell them all the same thing: "You've got to take your vacation goggles off." Carter said. For me, it was very falsely promoted. Once living there, I thought, you know, this isn't all you guys have cracked this up to be at all. And my read on this is: this is so much bigger than Florida. This is a life lesson, and I will repeat this again: take your vacation goggles off. This isn't all you guys have cracked this up to be at all. This is bigger than retiring in Florida. This is life. It is the grass is always greener on the other side. I sure. can't wait until I have this. I wish I had that. And then when you finally get what you wish you wanted, it's not all it's cracked up to be. I One of the things that I love about living in New York is the weather's not great. Um, although we have a beautiful day today, which affects the shit out of your mood. I am feeling- It really I'm, does. I'm feeling okay, Ben. Um, leaving New York and going to a place like California or a nice weather place, you're like, oh my God, why, why do I live in New York? And, but that's the point is that you, people adjust very quickly to a better situation in life, whether it's financial house, uh, weather, whatever you adjust and you get used to it. And what was special eventually becomes routine. And so you don't you, appreciate you, it as much anymore. Well, exactly. You actually mentioned to me when you were in Marco Island, you're like, you know, I think I could uh, retire down here or spend more my time wife down here. And I, my wife and I talked about this. Yeah. I, I asked you, I said, do you, and my question to you was going to be, do you think that millennials will retire in places like Florida? Like, because my baseline assumption is you're going to end up like your parents or your grandparents. Listen, I'm eating cottage cheese with fruit in it. Okay. So I'm already my dad. I'm a Jewish guy from New York. I will retire in Florida. That's just, that's, that's what we do. It's been preordained. Uh, I don't make But you rules. said to me, you said to me, dude, you're going to get bored. And I thought that too. Like, it is so awesome down here, but I feel like I would, because I'm going to have to go somewhere for at least six months out of the year to get out of the, I'm going to need to get out of the winter when I'm older. That's just, that's, that's going to be a fact. Um, do you remember, know, do you remember sorry, back another, in the another, day? Wait, another side tangent. Here's the, why is it that people from the East Coast of New York go to the Atlantic side of Florida and people from the Midwest go to the Gulf side. Because it was all Midwest people's, like if you judging by t-shirts and accents and... Yeah, I don't know what to tell you. That's just what it is. It's just a thing, isn't it? It's just a thing. Do you remember back in the day pretending to be sick in elementary school? By the way, I'm having deja vu. What, what was this? I had a something... There was a, a music or something that happened to me yesterday they did before where I was like, holy... Cow, it reminded me of being eight years old, and I can't remember what it was. All right. Sorry, podcast listener. That was a that could That could actually be a movie plot. You hear an, a song from your youth, and it transports you back to that year. Oh, my God. What was it? I can't remember. But anyhow, what I was trying to say is spending the first day home watching Jerry Springer all day. You're like, man, I can get used to this. Judge uh, Judge Judy. Sa- Sa- was it Sally Jesse Raphael? Yep. And Roy then Povich. on day... Day two, it's not as great. By day three, you're like, all right, I'm ready. To, I'm ready to go back to school. That's the thing with vacation, right? Is that you think, oh my god, I could do this every day. You can't do it every day because if you do it every day, it's not vacation. Then it's just life. Yes, that's why I actually think when I retire, I'm going to have to go different places all the time. You're going like, to be an Airbnb retiree. Spots. You're going to be an Airbnb retiree. I think so. So, we, but back to the original article that people sent us saying actually people are leaving Florida, but the the data in this shows. Florida has the second fastest growing state as of July, 2023, 700,000 people moved there in 2022. And so the data is showing a huge migration, but there's also people leaving. So that doesn't really tell us anything though. Like people, people are people, some people do love Florida. 
That's that's all point. Even though this article makes it out to be that there are individuals, this is why this is such this article is a microcosm of the economy. They they go through these individual experiences of people who hated their experience in Florida, but there are still way more people who love Florida who are going there. Of course, that's most people point. don't have the uh, most people aren't running away from the armadillo infestations. Yes, I didn't I didn't realize that was a thing. Okay, from the NAR. They have their statistics on the home buyers and sellers, like who's buying and selling homes. This is interesting. Uh, millennials, 25 to 43, now compromise 38% of the home buying market, up from 28% a year ago. Uh, boomers are down to 31% of transactions. So that flip-flop. Last year, it was boomers that were buying the most homes. This year, it's millennials. And I feel like it's that, that flip-flop is going to happen for a long time. Gen X was 4% of buyers. I feel like Gen X is the 3% mortgage people. Like They're like, mm-mm. <laughs> we're we're not we're not moving. We're not doing anything. Four percent of buyers, uh, forty four percent of older millennials are first time home buyers. This is interesting. The first time stuff. So first time home buyers made up thirty two percent of all buyers, up from twenty six percent a year ago. So it seems like houses are so unaffordable and mortgage rates so high that no one could possibly afford their first home. But that's a third of people buying homes are first time home buyers. Historical norm is forty percent, so it's still below that, but it's not bad. And among young younger millennials, so twenty five to thirty three. 75% of those younger millennials are first-time home buyers. That's pretty good, right? That I, now no, the there's nothing good about millennials buying houses right now. It's well, not, not good, but I guess the life goes on is my point. Like people are going to buy a house whether it's affordable or not. And and the other thing is and but they also said they said 24% of those younger millennials received down payment help from a friend or relative. So that Yeah, the it's a bloodbath. For young people in the housing market, it is completely and absolutely effed. Now, now some people would say, "Listen, they're locking themselves into way higher payments than they otherwise would have." But if you can scrape together and afford a payment now while rates are high and housing prices are high and your wages are going to rise in the future and you could refinance in the future to lower that payment, I think you're going to be okay. Fair? I'm just um, saying, these, these numbers surprise me for how high the first-time home buyer numbers were that a third of people buying homes in the last year were first-time I think home this buyers. Is, I think That's this is surprising. One of the, I think this is one of the biggest stories in the country that probably doesn't get enough attention because young people don't have microphones, is the struggle that young people are having with, with new homes. Here's an email that we got, not to just use like an anecdote, but... Um, one item that is not spoken about enough is how much unwanted stress and awkwardness this has put on our friendships. Meaning our friends have become our competitors with so little inventory, everyone in your social circle is competing for the same homes and oh, almost geez. has to keep secrets from each other. It's really bad, dude. Like, again, not to just use like my town as, as America, but there's, there's not a lot. And there's a lot of young people that want to move back home and there's just nothing there. And, the, and what is there, the prices are outrageous. Completely yeah. unaffordable. Not I'm like, sorry. I, I, I don't mean to make light of this, but this could also be a movie plot right now. Friends competing for lack of housing supply. That could be a. That would have been a Seth Rogen movie in the 2010s. The the situation is really, really, really bad. Oh, I agree, and it's going to make wealth inequality way, way, way worse because the people who can afford a home now are the people who are doing who are more well off, and the people who can't are going it, to. It it is it's. It's a problem. And the funny thing is, is there hasn't been one politician who's made this their their platform, like of we need to build more houses. I don't know Which how- Which is weird it, because I, isn't, I think the median age is 38 in the United States. I think there's, it's just beca because- There's so many young aspirational home buyers that are just getting absolutely railroaded right now. Yes, I agree. Someone also emailed us and said, how are so many houses being purchased in cash? Uh, it's either line of credit for, uh, like from a portfolio or it's a HELOC on a paid off home to purchase the next home, next home. And then you pay off the HELOC once the previous one is. So it's not like people have $500,000 sitting in a bank to buy a house. A lot of times it's some other shenanigans, a bridge loan, borrowing I think what portfolio. You just, I think those two things are like, a, I'm not saying that that's not a thing that happens. If I had to guess, I would say that's, that's a 5% slice of the pie. All right. I would love to see the breakout of this. I, I, I honestly don't know. So like, where are the all cash buyers coming from? Right. Now, did, did, maybe you said this, what percentage of first time home buyers are paying with cash? I, I don't, it didn't say that's okay. gotta be very low though. I'm sure it's. Anyway, low. the situation is just really not great. 
Um, there was an article about ta- the tax ramifications of grandparents making loans to their grandchildren. We got a few emails like okay. this, like uh, an enhanced inheritance type of thing. Um, Jill, the the amazing Jill Schlesinger uh, has a video with the Compound Media talking about exactly this topic. Should you help your children buy a, buy a house? And, and the actual like, because there's 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 tax. There's rules that's, behind it, right? You have to. Yeah. There's a certain interest rate you have to charge. Yeah. 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 Right. Okay. Here's a good question. I, I wanted to pose to you. Someone emailed us this. I took out a heel, and this kind of sounds similar to me. I took out a HELOC in 2021 and rates for 3%, planning to borrow against my home slowly over time for renovations and such. Now the rates are 7 to 8% for a HELOC. I realize I should have just done a cash out refinance. If mortgage rates went back to 3% or even 4% tomorrow, I would borrow as much as I could. My house is up probably 7% since 2020, not the brag. We just discussed what, this last week. There's going to be a boom. What a would you so say? What would you do? Boom. So, if if rates went back to th- if mortgage rates went back to three or four percent tomorrow, what would you do? Would you borrow every every last bit of equity that you could? Would you take I it would, out? Uh, I would seek advice on that. I don't want to say me personally. I'm saying like to the to the emailer. Like, yeah, I'm asking I'm asking what you personally would do because I I would probably do the same thing that they're saying. I would pull equity out. That's what. Well, the, I I did do that. Yeah, you did. That's it. what I did. I, I, I wouldn't necessarily you did a like have a use. For for it, but I would I would pull it out and I would probably pull it out immediately. I, I think I would, and I think that's gonna be a lot of people. Yeah. Um, all right, real quick, Lucas Shaw did a post on uh the streaming services, the most watched things over the last uh good newsletter, by the way, Lucas Shaw. Over the last three years, yes. Um, eight of the ten shows, eight of the top ten shows. Oh, most of their viewership to Netflix, Bluey, and the Big Bang Theory are the exception. So the chart is time spent streaming shows um, that were in the top 10. So we're only looking at the top 10. NCIS, uh, number one. Coco Melon, which is for kids, number two. Grey's Anatomy, number uh, three. Talk about being seared into your brain, Coco Melon. Yeah. Nine what? of the 10 most watched streaming programs are reruns. Uh, if, you, if you look at these shows, th- this says a lot about the taste of a the average American is just not very good. NCIS and Criminal Minds and The Big Bang Theory. I don't mean to hate on people if they like these shows, but like none of these are like actually good shows. They're like it's, it's like filler. Is there one really well, good nine of the most, n- nine of the nine of the ten are reruns. The only original there is uh, Stranger Things. The interesting one to me was the most, did you see what the most downloaded or streamed movie was in 2023? And it, well, there wasn't a close second. Moana? Moana. Yeah, I think I saw that. Which is not that surprising to me. Uh, so sure. while reruns dominate the top 10, overall, that's not the case. So that matters. Most of the 100 most popular titles of the last three years are original series. Okay, that makes sense. And uh, time spent streaming shows... In the top 10, it's it's Netflix and then it's everything else, pretty much. Netflix still rules. Netflix still rules. All right. Um, let's talk about gambling. What do you got, Ben? All right. So there's been a few scandals in like the NBA about people not point shaving, but ch- changing their own stat lines. And so there's a lot, there's a lot of talk about like, okay, the all the league has been pushing gambling, and there's gonna there's gonna be all these gambling crises in the years ahead and it's it's showing the sports betting boom from gaming and it went from like less than a billion dollars in 2019 to 11 billion dollars in 2023 this is revenue from legal sports betting and this is another extreme thing where some people say oh let them gamble it's a form of entertainment and other people say no no no, it's going to ruin people's lives and the truth is probably usually somewhere in the middle where do you fall on this because i can there's going to be stories in the years ahead of of people who have just completely ruined their lives betting on sports. All right. I hope this is not like a, a straw man cop out. The way that I view sports gambling is similar to how I view alcohol. Like there's, there's people that abuse it. There's people whose lives are ruined by it. And most people are able to use it recreationally and not spiral out of control. And perhaps the, the downsides of, of gambling I don't even want to say it worse because what could be worse than drunk driving, right? So plenty of lies ruined by alcohol. Yes, I, I just I don't know what to do about it. There are people for who now there might be somebody listening whose whose child is addicted and, and are getting upset. And yeah, there's there's going to be things in this that are 
less than desirable. I don't know. I mean, I mean do obviously they, they they have their legalese figured out. They have more lawyers than anyone. But is someone going to try to sue a sports league or a podcast network in the coming years for pushing sports gambling all the time? Yeah, probably. Is that where we're headed? Yeah, probably. I, I anyway. I, I again. I, I think it's. I I view gambling as a form of entertainment. But I can. So see do you how think I, the alcohol analogy is a fair one? Like it's, yes. it's there's parallels there. Definitely. Yes. Um. All right. I was in the mall. Over the weekend, I what went. What do you with, keep going to the mall for? What, I'll tell what are you. you doing? I'll, I'll tell you why. Um, my son Kobe, uh, we had a baseball game. So we're, this is it's it's horrendous, Ben. You 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 know what this is about. He's seven years old, and they just started in little league kids pitching. So either two things happen. Oh my one, gosh! Good luck. <laughs> one ever contact with a ball. One there's kids that can pitch really well. And so if the kid can pitch well, the, the other kid can't hit them, right? Or there's kids that can't even come close to getting it over the plate. Right. So and so eventually- the Strikeouts go on. So the, the game's an hour and 45 minutes, and they just started on Wednesday at 5.30. So we're not going to be getting home with the kids until 7.45. It's not, it's not great. I'm just going to tell kids pitch that early, because my son is, he's in a first and second grade team, and it still coaches pitch. Okay. So maybe next year. So, so on Sunday, we had our first game- and he was like, I want to pitch. I want to pitch. And he's never pitched before. And he said to Robin, mom, don't worry. I got this. <laughs> and I am so happy that he is an irrational, overconfident kid. Like that's obviously yeah. just a personality, the way you were born type thing. So I'm happy he has yeah. that. Anyway, the reason why I went to the mall was because I need a baseball glove. I don't have a baseball glove. So I need a, need a baseball glove to practice with him. Okay. So that's why I went to the mall. Right. Uh, Roosevelt Field on Saturday. I couldn't believe it. I can't tell you the last time that I was there on a weekend, I think, like this. It was beyond packed. I took a picture of the Apple Store as I went by. Not sure, not sure why I took a picture of the Apple Store instead of the whole mall, but dude, it was slammed. I don't the know if this of the is a reflection. The Apple Store you took looks like a stock picture that's in like an AP News story. I don't know if this is a reflection of just Roosevelt Field specifically, which is a really big mall around here. The economy or kids' preferences, they hang no, out here. We went to the mall like a month ago. Uh, by us. And it was same thing packed. And I was like, geez, I not expecting it. Yeah. So when you go places like this and when you go to the airport and you go on vacation, this is not just anecdote. Look at the numbers. The economy is fine. The economy is pretty people good. It's a lot better people than people are still feel. spending money. Yeah. Yes. People are just spending money. Um, all right, Ben, I, Watch what I they do not what they say, you know, we've spoken in the past. I've spoken in the past about things, particularly with, with eh, not just cooking, like, Things on Instagram that don't come close to matching what you see on, on Instagram, like the right. sneaker cleaners that never work or the recipe or the this hack or the that hack, like cut, plucking the pineapple piece out individually doesn't work. Right. I tried to poach an egg for the first time. Look at that picture. What do you think? Not bad. Not you terrible. Ever, you ever poach an egg before? Is that where you like put it in the boiling water? Yes. It was quite difficult. Okay. That's one of those things that um, the finished product is not worth all the effort. Fair? Disagree. Okay. I made you my wife an it. I made my wife an avocado toast, and it was pretty darn tasty. Now it was a lot of work, but it actually did come out decent. All right, it last thing. Good. Last thing. Um, I lost my I lost another pair of AirPods, and this time I lost them in my house. I remember specifically putting the AirPods in to do the dishes and I can't find them. So I was walking to the train station the other day. I needed some headphones and I bought a pair of uh, like Alexa AirBuds years ago just to try them out. It was like a Black Monday type deal. They're not great, so I don't wear them. But I, I couldn't get them synced. You have to go into the Alexa app to hook them up with your Bluetooth. Look at this thing. Solve this puzzle to protect your account. Enter the letters and numbers above. Is this completely indecipherable or what? What the hell does that say? The funny thing is you're, you're going to need AI to help you solve these puzzles now. So that didn't work. And then there's a button, an option to say, here are the characters. So I said, okay, wonderful. I didn't know there's an option. G8. It's, I'm not, okay, anyway. So I press play and it was somebody talking, right? Ostensibly for blind people. Except inexplicably, instead of just saying G, M, E, H eight, there was like a fishbowl water noise over the person speaking. 
why are they making it impossible for you to sign in? What what are they trying to do here? We just need the face scan for everything. Instead of I'm I'm ready to get rid of passwords completely. It's unbelievable. Scan my eyeballs. Uh, get it over with. All right, Ben. Recommendations. What do you got? All right, wait. What is this? Oh, Ben, your flying life is about to change when you find out you can download movies on all the streaming apps to watch them offline. <laughs> A few people said this. Here's the thing. <laughs> The best part about streaming and being on an airplane is scrolling through the movies and totally. finding that. So I don't want to know what I'm going to watch ahead of time. I want to scroll. Yeah, it's like walking into a blockbuster. You want to be surprised. Yes, I want to. Okay, oh, I didn't so know they I, had this. Yes, that's what I. That's what I like about it. So I did watch the, the finale of Curb, Your Enthusiasm, and I talked to my wife about this afterwards. It's not necessarily. I wouldn't necessarily say it's like the best comedy show ever because you don't get involved in the plot lines or the characters. You don't really care what happens to them, but. That show made me belly laugh more than any show ever. And there isn't a second place. It Just the amount of belly laughs. Even this season, there's probably, like the Bruce Springsteen <laughs> episode was amazing. I thought the finale was great. The way that they, you didn't finish Seinfeld, so you don't know this, but the way they intertwined the Seinfeld finale was, I thought, just perfect. And it made me, when they showed the clips of the old episodes, I went back and watched last night the Dahl episode with the bottle in his pants, which I think is one of the best episodes ever. And I watched the ghost, the crazy killer eyes one, crazy eyes killer. Uh, cr yeah, so good. So I watched some of the old episodes because of it. And yeah, that show made, gave me Remember more hard lift? laughs than any, any show ever. Yeah, I forgot about some of them. So I'm ski lift go was my favorite one ever. Okay. Uh, so a bunch of people, you, you mentioned the plot to shot caller last week. Could you, you believe how many emails we got? Yes, a lot of people. I, I had literally never heard of that. I've seen the movie on Netflix before, but I was like, eh, it's the guy from Game of Thrones. Jamie Lannister. Did you watch did it? You, did you? Oh yeah, I did. I did. I love. I, I I loved this movie. Oh my gosh. I I like put it on. We had a really early flight in the morning on Saturday, so I was super tired, and I'm like, I'm just gonna go to bed. But I want to put on this movie for like ten minutes while I check my email and stuff. <laughs> you didn't turn it off. And I got sucked in, and I watched the whole movie, and it, I, I it couldn't rips. believe how how it's a really great. It's now it's one of those movies that the circumstances make you think like, geez, how would I ever. Like if you had a few bad breaks and you ended up in a, in a crazy situation, what would you do? That's part of the great part of the movie, but the whole mystery of it, like, is he a good guy? Is he a bad guy? What is he actually doing? It was an awesome movie. It was, it was so good. It was really good. So we, we got another email um, from somebody saying, and at, but yeah, I can't believe how many emails we got about Shot Caller. Unbelievable. Yes. And I, somebody said, and after you watch Shot Caller, watch Chopper. Uh, it's, okay. it's from 2001. It's with Eric Bana. Uh, let's see. America had Al Capone, England, the Cray brothers and Australia proving once and for all it's antipodian. What is that word? Sense of humor has Mark Chopper read. Chopper is inspired by the books of Mark Brandon. All right. This is, I'm sorry. I shouldn't have read that. Uh, whatever. It's about a criminal in Australia and it's supposed to be very good. That's all the end. Okay. Shot call is right. Uh, one other one. I feel like the weird thing about streaming these days is you can have a big movie star that's in a show. And you never even hear any publicity about the show even coming out. It just shows up. All right, such like, as? There a, there, well, there was a Nicole Kidman one on Amazon earlier this year. But I turned on Apple TV the other day, and there is a new private detective show with Colin Farrell. And I'm, it's like Colin Farrell is a guy who, if, if you have someone missing and want discretion, he's the guy you bring in. And I'm like, sold. So it's called Sugar on Apple TV+. Plus, and I watched the first episode, and it's very stylish. And I'm a huge Colin Farrell fan. Yeah, you are. And one episode, and I'm, I'm completely in. Okay. Anything from you this week? Uh, anything from me? Well, I watched Shot Caller. I'm I'm plowing. I'm making my way through through Tokyo Vice. Uh, and that's about it. Uh, okay. I oh, was surprised. I, I was expecting Shot Caller to be a movie that I that would be just a stupid plot movie that's kind of entertaining, but it was, it was just I don't know. It, something about it. It was just very very well done. All right. Um. Animal Spirits Pod at thecompoundnews.com. Personal emails, of course, personal responses. Don't forget to check out. We had a talker book this week with Schaefer Cullen on emerging market fundamentals. Quite good. Quite a good episode. Earl Sharma is like one of the longest running EM portfolio managers. He was a super sharp guy. He taught us a lot. But if you're thinking about diversifying away, he had a lot of good stuff in emerging markets. Yep. Uh, all right. Thank you for listening. We will see you next week.